How's everyone today? Blessed. I'm Costco Jones. I'll be moderating this session. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out to the sixth annual uh, Black Sustainability Summit. Uh, again, it's Mercury Retrograde and my computer doesn't want to show the slides that I was supposed to show here. So I'm going to stop. I can see if I can um, presenter here. Ahead. If you want to share your screen, you can go ahead and uh, get started. I don't know what's going on. With my I can share I can share the, um, the introduction slide. And then you can uh, just present you just tell me when I when I need to go to the next slide. Uh, thank. Okay, there we go. Are we back now? Okay. All right. Uh, Tahuti Ma'a, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, jump in. All right. What kind of are you still is slides? Uh, I believe it's, it's. Let's just go ahead and get started on your on your part. I think you can come in. On All that. right. Good. Thanks. First of all, I want to give thanks to the organizers, all of you who are present. Um, and I just greatly give thanks for this opportunity to be here to further my mission in this life and in this incarnation. My name is As Neferka. You can also call me Nef. I am a spiritual warrior. I'm a revolutionary. I'm a healing artist. I am coming to you live from Ma'at Mountain here on the volcanic island of Fogu in the occupied territory known as Cabo Verde, as the Portuguese colonizers or invaders called this land on the west coast of the great continent of Africa. And I am thankful to be here. And in this moment, I just ask for everyone in their own right to present a land acknowledgement through really just rooting the reality that we are part of Geb, which is what our ancestors called this um, planet and our body being part of that and really rooting everything within this land base that we have. As we know, we're all coming to us, the connectivity of our great ecosystem that we are all part of. So I just want to acknowledge the land that I'm on. And I also want to ask my beloved elders, I see one person, Vivian, for permission to speak, um, if I may continue. Yes, Tahuti, you have my permission. Thank you Good. so much. Good, thanks, Mama. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get right into things. I have to use my slides because I am Tehuti, which is that Gemini energy. And when I get to talking, <laughs> I need these slides to be that control mechanism. Can someone please confirm for me that you can see the slide show? Yes. Just yes. So the title of the presentation that has been given to me to be a conduit for this message, which is really part of my, my mission and my, my mandate in this life and in this incarnate to embody the energy of truth, which is Tehuti Ma'at. Um, so this message of restoring our people and planet is an eternal message as we'll see as we continue to go in. So, oops, all right. So I just want us to begin within the 
I don't know where everyone's coming from, if we've just come from a previous um, lecture, presentation, the panel, we're coming from our own lives, but really just taking a moment to begin within the beginning and come back into center. Through our breath, we honor the divinity that we are, as we are, all connected, to take a conscious breath Before we begin, we began our journey into eternity to liberate our African mind, the cosmic mind, the divine mind, to find the answers to how, to find the way to liberate our African body and spirit, we are free in soul and connected to all those who have led the way. Ashe, calling in all the great ancestors whose shoulders I stand on. Ashe, so the flow for our presentation today, we're gonna really begin with an ancestral orientation into the cosmic reality of where we're coming from, where we're going, and really coming into eternity. We're gonna put ourselves, we're gonna orient ourselves within the continuum of our story and where we've been, where we're going as we look forward. And then we're gonna go into this pro, what I'm calling a pro-carbon world, a pro-carbon narrative, which is very, um, it's literally um, juxtaposed with this post-carbon or anti-carbon narrative that we're being told is sustainable. And we're gonna question that narrative. And we're also going to um, discuss this narrative of sustainable development as it's being called. And from there, as we have a critical and analytical assessment of this narrative, we're gonna really go into what nature's message is right now. I'm a farmer, right? And the land is speaking, nature, netter, nature, whatever way we want to bring forward that vibration of this cosmic energy that we're all a part of, that's indwelling within us. It has a very profound message right now. And that message is being, um, shield, it's being um, overlaid with a projection of a false narrative in order to confuse and defuse the revolution that we're um, within right now. So we're gonna go into that revolutionary reality and talk about restorative development within the context of the 11 pillars of Tehuti Ma'at, which is a revolutionary instrument that I co-founded. And it's going to be specifically in the context of agriculture and how we do land work. Okay, so ancestrally, I really wanna begin with what is Tehuti Ma'at? Because I mentioned Tehuti Ma'at as something that was founded, right? A, a revolutionary instrument. This is just the layer of the terrestrial um, embodiment of what really are cosmic principles. Tehuti and Ma'at are complementary energies and forces of Netter that are divine ancestors of the Hapi Valley, or most may know as the Nile Valley, right? Modern day Uganda, Sudan, um, Egypt, that land and the ancestors that were there, Ethiopia, and the legacy of the continuation of those great peoples and the Mecca that was created in the land that they called Kemet, the black land. And this tradition is very rich in one, we, we speak a lot about the oral tradition, but very little is because in the Western world, as they call it, right? In the Eurocentric world, they don't want to acknowledge the records and the written tradition that we have. So while the oral tradition is very powerful, it is coupled with a thorough written carved into stone, right? Tradition. And this is what I'm raising for us right now. These cosmic principles of Tehuti Ma'at that you see on the right-hand side. The Tehuti principle is embodied in this image of the Ibis bird, which was the symbol of Tehuti, which was considered to be a masculine energy and a complementary energy to Ma'at, which is the, the 
the woman that is kneeled in front of this ibis bird with the ostrich feather coming up from her crown. Now, this is a divine feminine principle. As I said, they're complementary energies. They were seen to be a couple, right? And they work in tandem. And usually you would see the image of Tehuti, the ibis bird um, on as a mask on the body of a man. And that was representing the embodiment and the personification of this divine principle of wisdom, of knowledge, communication, expression, right? It's that mercurial energy. The brother mentioned mercury in retrograde, right? So that mercurial energy is considered to be one of communication, technology, connection, right? So it is the record keeper, the scribe. And that's usually how Tehuti is shown and we'll see later on. And Ma'at represented by this ostrich feather was the feminine principle usually shown with outspread falcon wings. And we also see, which we'll, I'll show some image of a little later, the scales of Ma'at, which I'll talk a little bit more about, which our first depiction of the scales of justice come from our African ancestors, right? And it was shown next to the heart. So we're going into the solar principle, right? Because our whole tradition is based on this as above, so below, which is what Ma'at really represents. It's this symmetry, this reciprocity, this um, harmony, right? This balanced energy that encompasses wholeness, right? And that is what is truth. That is what is just. What we call, for Tehuti Ma'at, what we call this is holistic symmetry. And this is what we're all a part of right now. It's not something that was and is gone now. It always is. Remember, Tehuti and Ma'a are cosmic principles and energies. So right in the sense, so you have a couple of images here that I feel clearly depict holistic symmetry, right? That sacred geometry, that pattern of the universe, of this universe, right? And acknowledging we are in a, a one universe, there are multiverses. And within the context of this vastness of what we are a part of, right? Just like we can look at a grain of sand on a beach, right? And that's really what the orientation I really want us to take. And coming into the center of this image of the Sankofa that is in front of us. And sometimes we see that other image of Sankofa. For those who are not familiar, Sankofa is um, an Adinkra symbol of the Akan people. And really, this symbol represents going back into the future, right? It really puts us into the context of eternity because in our African cosmic mind, there is no separation. We're not, we're not limited to space and time, although we are incarnate in bodies that are moving through these dimensions. The reality is we are in a cosmic experience and there is, there, it really stands outside of time. And it's really operating within the context of eternity. So there is no past, present, and future. Everything is in continuum and everything is connected. And what the Sankofa represents is for us to look back in order to retrieve what from the past we need to move forward into the future and continue our spiraled expansion on this planet and in this universe. So that's really what the Tehuti Ma'at is, it's us looking back to reclaim the value and the power that we had, that we carved into stone, that we carved into stone because we actually knew we would be here. And to embody this holistic symmetry is really about being present because the moment that is the past and that is the future is right now. And that is the moment we have power within because we have the power of choice in the moment that we're in right now. So that's really what I wanna call forward. I'm using this quote here from our beloved Nana John Hendrick Clark. Slavery in the measurement of time because we are the oldest people functioning on this earth. We were functioning 4 million years ago. When we look at the societies that we've have produced 500 years out of that time is one half of the wink of an eye. Let's not get distracted by that. But we do acknowledge the reality of what that experience represents in terms of resilience, strength, and power that we now have, and we have been strengthened as a people because of it. 
So these narratives around that we want to shed as we go through this process, right? Our story really begins in ancient Africa. And I put the Ra in there because that was our ancestral, um, in the Meduneta or the hieroglyphic um, pronunciation or vibration, that divine communication of our ancestors. The Ra represents the physical form of the sun. And we know we are solar powered beings operating on a solar powered electromagnetic planet. And within that context, it's important because there's so much, you know, around the vibration of Africa, what it means. So we harmonize, right, in the presence. This becomes a example of that Sankofa, how we're bringing the past, that Ra, that ancestral rooting into what we've been given, Africa, so everybody understands where we're going, right? It's not, it's not too far-fetched. That's, that type of um, symmetry is what we must do. We must look at where we are right now and we have to be realistic in our approach. So in looking at this ancient tradition of ours, really, where we birth civilization, we have to root that in agriculture, right? Because our, and we'll do this a little more as we go on, but our ancestors' ability to trans transcend for lack of a better word of putting it, but to develop into the farming culture was very significant because instead of being hunters and gatherers and a moving people, nomadic people, we were able to then as, the, as we learned to cultivate the land to stay in one place and to be able to cultivate the land and create surplus. And from that surplus, that's when we're able to be and observe and connect with nature in those profound ways where we can observe the cosmos and the stars and everything that's happening and be able to create these systems and define these philosophies such as Tehuti Ma'at that we just covered. The, the architecture that we see all throughout the Nile Valley. So agriculture is what birthed mathematics. Agriculture is what birthed all aspects of civilization, astronomy, astrology, all of it. And that's the significance of land. And when we look at imperialism in this moment, this wink of an eye, as Baba Clark said, where this invasion and this enslavement is happening, it is all based on land because these people come and they, what? They take over the land. And we are part of that land. Our labor is the unspoken resource, right? when we're talking, when, when resources are being talked about in the global stage, right? And they're not talking about enslavement anymore, but really that's really still the, the name of the game in this moment we're in right now. And we also acknowledge the continuum that continued from that imperialism, which we're in neo-colonial, neo-imperial, um, this European world disorder. And within that, there have been these independent struggles all throughout the continent, these abolition movements. We have the civil rights movement, the black power movement. This is what this is all a continuum of. This is what we must continue. We can't adopt narratives that sever our connection to our story. And as I said, these are Brother Malcolm, um, El Haj Malik El Shabazz words. Revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. So when we look at the land of our ancestors and we look at what we've left behind and how we geo-positioned these forms, these, these structures to align with celestial bodies, we see that there's a message that our ancestors, that we ultimately, right? Because we are our ancestors that we've left behind. And this is what we're retrieving. So Ma'at, you see the, ju the, the judgment scene to the right, which has the scales of Ma'at, as I showed you. On the left-hand side, you have the jar that has the heart. And on the right-hand side, you have the feather, the ostrich feather. At the top in the center, you see Ma'at present wearing the ostrich feather. And you also see Tehuti keeping the record of the judgment on the right-hand side with that mask that I described earlier of the Ibis bird. The reason why the Ibis bird was used is because our ancestors being a beautiful and divine nature based and with deep reverence for nature, observed that the Ibis bird when it is 
in the sand or on the Nile banks and it's eating, it looks like it's literally signing a signature. And it's, it's very beautiful. And so that depiction becomes how the embodiment of this cosmic knowledge and information is symbolized for us, right? And when we think about the heart, the heart being weighed, we also go back to that solar, that solar space where we're acknowledging that the heart is the center of our solar system, right? So we are in that as above, so below. So while we're in a plant, we're on a planet that's in a solar system, that's in a galaxy, right? And we can expand out from that. We acknowledge that we have that all happening inside of us right now on a cellular level. And with this ancestral tradition, because in Kemet, it's very, um, there's so much documentation. I really want to show that that grandeur and glory still embody the deep reverence for farming and agriculture. You see the heck and the keka that the um, Nesubiti or what we call the Pharaoh um, in, in the Greek uh, vernacular, they are farming tools. One is used and it, and it represents that divine symmetry of ma'at. One collects and one moves energy, pulling energy in, the other one moves energy out. And this, it, these are literal farming tools that are used in farming. And all of this is really to move us into a position of power as we're looking at how are we gonna restore ourselves? How are we gonna restore our people? How are we gonna restore the planet in this situation that we're in? Because we're looking at the chaos around us and it's looking stark when we're looking at it through the lens and the narrative of the opposition right, because they are in a position of power. So Huey P. Newton, the, one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party, defined power as the ability to define phenomenon, not only to define phenomenon, but to make it act in a desired manner. So this power of definition is very, very important for us. And I'm just gonna play this short, I'm, I'm not gonna play this whole video, but I'm gonna play a little bit of this video of Dr. Sebi because that's what our beloved Dr. Sebi provided us with. Although he might not have had all the answers, which none of us do, he brought in a significant piece, which was to challenge the established narrative on damn near everything. So I'm just gonna play this clip. Uh, what is melanin and what is carbon? Tell us about those two minerals. Well, they are. Melanin is not a mineral. Okay. Melanin is a word that was used to describe a certain biological function. Mm -hmm. But that particular identification or category or thing, melanin, is a European identification of what they think activates those neurons in our body that makes us black. But when you break down our body, our biological structure into what we would have to put it in, which is chemistry, biochemistry, Melanin has no place. It's not to be found. What is found in the body that is attributed to melanin is carbon. Carbon not only determines the quality of life in black folks, carbon determines the quality of life in every living plant that exists that is natural. If carbon is absent, there's no life. Melanin, what is it? I don't know. Why are white people trying to get some? It's a Greek word. Okay. And the reason why I think it's so important, right, that power of definition is Baba Amos Wilson, and Wilson, who wrote the book, The Blueprint for Black Power, really talks a lot about making sure we're asking the right question before we even begin to look for the answer, right? Because we often talk about melanin which is a, within the Eurocentric paradigm, within their 
institutional framework, which is their limited, limited ability to even explore the topic to begin with, this topic of what we consider to be our blackness, right? And, and when I say blackness, I even think of it on the color spectrum of how black absorbs all light. It absorbs. And that's literally what carbon, what carbon is. And this idea of pro-carbon is very important because when the conversation comes on the on the basis of carbon, we're dealing with it in its totality in terms of what we mean when we say that Africa, that African people, that Black people are the womb of humanity, right? But what that means is that we're actually saying we our inheritance is that we are this entire planet and we are the cosmos. It's not limited to that particular landmass. There was a point when that land was all one. There was a point when there was no land and it was all water. There was a point where it was nothing but cosmos before coming into form and manifestation in this way that we're experiencing right now. And that's still, and we were still there. We were still there. And that piece is very critical because now this narrative around sustainability, around climate change and all these things that we're being um, told is what we need to focus on. Yes, we need to focus on our ecosystem, but from our own narrative. And that's what this, this is all about. This is about the African centered perspective on what's going on with our planet and how our climate is changing because it is changing and that can't be denied but everything changes and that's a natural process right so when we look at carbon in this context we're not looking at carbon as a negative thing in the way that the media and everything is depicting carbon right co2 we got to reduce the carbon footprint what are they saying when they say they have to reduce the carbon footprint it's the same narrative of eugenics, what they call eugenics, right? This focus on race, this creation that they've created and this concept. And we're talking about genocide, to put it directly. That's what we're talking about when they say reduce the carbon footprint. So we have to know what that means so we don't perpetuate narratives that are actually genocidal to us. So as I said, carbon, the building blocks of life. Why? Because it's just the perfect um, molecular structure, right? Carbon bonds are strong and they're stable, but they're not so strong that they can't rearrange. They can easily rearrange. And this is why we find it. In, carbon is the base of, of carbs, protein, DNA, all of these things. But in the context of post-carbon and the way that they present this narrative, they're talking about the air that we breathe out. Right, And we've all learned from the very beginning that the trees produce the oxygen that we need and we let out the carbon dioxide and the trees then take that and transform that into the oxygen in this beautiful cycle of life. And somehow we've hyper-focused on one end of the spectrum and not the other. And we're looking at that as a negative thing. We're looking at carbon carbon dioxide. And the other thing is they talk about it very vaguely. They're not coming from a deeply rooted scientific perspective on it at all. They keep it vague because they know that the majority of people don't even really understand that there's different types of carbon. And it doesn't really matter to distinguish it at this point. As we said, everything is everything, all is one. So in the context of our breath, our life source, that's our life source. So they're saying that there's too much life on the planet. And what they've done with the narrative that people have perpetuated, really they've perpetuated, but now it's come into the mainstream. So people are perpetuating it as well. People who are well-meaning people who are in positions where they really are looking to do what they think is best and don't have the proper orientation. But what's happened? We have this whole um, carbon market that's been created where they're offsetting carbon, right? And within that narrative, they're also taking people's land, literally on the continent here in Africa, they're taking people's land in the guise of these carbon offsets so they can build what? Lumber forests, all kinds. It's, it's, a, it's really amazing what's actually happening under this guise, it's just like the aid. The aid is supposed to be supporting the people, but it's literally doing the opposite. 
So they created carbon markets. They're literally trading carbon, cre carbon credits, right? So they add to their fallacious um, economy that's based on nothing but fiat, has no value. And what do they do? They create and they add value to it because now they're basing it off of actual resources, right? And all of it is usually, I, I can't even get into that, I'm sorry. Par the Paris Climate Agreement I wanna highlight here because really what they've done on a global level at this point because of this narrative is they've created a global tax grid. And although the financial aspect is significant to a degree because it's part of the energy code that we're all subconsciously agreeing to by operating in this system, it's not the baseline because like I said, we have to remember the life piece and the genocidal aspect that this narrative actually perpetuates. So within the universal order, they're still operating in the context of oil, even though they're saying anti-carbon, they're saying all these things, but it actually is still the carbon. It is the very people who have, it's the Rockefeller Foundation, it's the Carnegie Foundation, it's the, pe the standard oil, the people whose legacies are in oil and exploitation and extracting from the planet are the same ones who are now on the global stage at the United Nations controlling the narrative. And now it's so pervasive that it's leaked into the regional market because that's actually how they've controlled things is they implement these agreements that they create, these development goals into every sovereign, seemingly sovereign nation, some illogically called nations, but into these um, governing systems through local municipalities. And that's how on the local stage, it's actually affecting our lives. And I wanna just talk about what is sustainability and what is sustainable development in the context of the United Nations because they're the ones perpetuating this. The first use of this term, this idea of sustainable development is actually coming from um, the U a UN sponsored seminar, which was in 1980. And they produced a study titled World Conservation Strategy, Living Resources, Conservation for Sustainable Development. And this was prom um, promoted by the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, okay? And from there, you had the, the Agenda 21. Agenda 21 was what was produced at the um, the Earth Summit in 1992 in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. When this, when this um, Agenda 21, this agenda for the 21st century was published by the UN, this, this um, term sustainable development began to get a couple, like get teeth, right? Before that in 1987, it was, it was also published um, by a member of the Trilateral Commission, which is one of the one of the bodies of the European world disorder that controls kind of this geopolitical environment that we exist in and that's imposed on us. They produced our common future for the World Commission of Environment and Development. So they've been, so I, I'm giving that context because they've been using this for for a while within a particular context. So we can't just adopt this term and not look at the totality of what it's connected to. But even on a baseline of looking at the word sustainable, it's being able to maintain at a certain level, right? It's able to be upheld, right? So it's continuing something to sustain something, which isn't inherently a bad thing. We do want to be sustainable, but at this point of looking at where we're at right now in the chaos, why would we want to sustain this chaos? We don't, we don't want to sustain the chaos. They want to sustain capitalism. They want to sustain this overconsumption, this extraction and this exploitation because they benefit from it. So we have to adopt restoration before we can even think about sustainability. So the UN actually defines it as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So really when they say sustainable, it's not saying anything. It can still be chemicals, it can still be consumption, it can still be extract, extracting, right? The agriculture is not talking organic. It's any agriculture really that fits within a framework that they sanction. 
This is important because this is the idea, this idea of sustainability, this is the idea we've been given and we have to scrutinize it. And Dr. Am Amos Wilson said the ultimate power base, the ultimate base of power for other power sources it is that of the power of ideas for ideas are actualized and incarnated in patterns of social attitudes, relations, and organization in social and physical products in abilities, inabilities, subordinations, and superordinations. So this is Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who is a great resource. Um, our beloved elder, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, created this pyramid analysis, which is a way, an African-centered way for us to synthesize information holistically. Remember, we, everything has to be within that holistic symmetry. So sometimes when we're saying um, sustainability, we really mean holistic. And holistic says a lot more than sustainable because it doesn't have that tie, that um, political tie or weight of everything that I just shared, right? And it's also very ancestral because when you think of wholeness, you can't really create a different definition of that. So in this analysis, it's looking at the culture, economics and politics and how all of this is all connected and how all these systems interconnect. Because in Eurocentricity, we're taught to dichotomize everything and split things and compartmentalize and not look at the whole picture. And this gives us a way to synthesize information, to look at the thesis, look at the antithesis and make our own assessment. So they've presented sustainability. We're saying restoration. And you're able to synthesize this by looking at the economic, political, and cultural ramifications of this. For Tehuti Ma'at as an instrument, a revolutionary instrument, we embody this because our focus areas are creativity, education, and healing as the foundation of all of the programming and institutional work that we do. So within this pyramid analysis, we have to center ourselves from that African-centered perspective, right? The cultural is the cosmology, right? What is the origin? What are the values, right? So we're coming from that indigenous cosmic nature-based approach when we're talking about restoration and honoring nature and knowing that nature is on its own rhythm and cycle. And we're also looking at the ecology, right? Which is the economics, but not in the context that they speak of economics, not about money, banks and debit cards, but it's actually what those currencies and those ways of trade are used for, which is our actual needs, the energy, the water, the food, clothing, shelter, and security, right? And then on the administrative side, which is the politics, we're dealing with the sociology and how all of that is administered and organized. And we're talking, when we talk about restoration, we talk about nation building and the need to look at ourselves as a nation and really begin to build the alternatives to what is coming down. Because the thing that they're trying very hard to sustain and they want to galvanize our energy to sustain is coming down. And that's why they're trying so hard to sustain it. And they're using our power and our energy as a battery to do that. So I'm asking for us to divest from that narrative and look at the actual reality of needing the alternative system to manage the ecology based on our cosmology and our indigenous traditions. And that's really what nature's message is. It's the cosmos, right? Everything moving in cycles. We look at nature in the context and I highlight the NTR because netter or inter or nature, this is our cosmic original vibration that our, our ancestors um, in the Nile Valley had. And it is the basis of this same principle, the same word, in many other languages, even though they kind of focus it on its um, terrestrial aspect, it's actually a cosmic energy. Netter is the God principle, it's the divine principle, it's the totality of everything. And sometimes it's depicted as Neteru, which is what I showed you like with the Tehuti and Ma'at, these are aspects of nature or nature. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm just gonna be driving through this a little more further. In our tradition, we have this principle of regeneration that's shown in many different ways. It's regrowth, it's, revive, it's revival, it's replacement, it's resurrection. And this is depicted as that masculine principle of literally the erection. And we literally mounted these structures known as tekenu, they call them aglis in the Greek, but these tekenu representing that erection or that resurrection, which really shows the vitality of our planet and its ability to regenerate. 
And we have many different traditions. I won't be able to go too deep into it, but the Ankh is a great, a great one because it just speaks to that family, the, the ultimate institution of restoration and continuation and life is the family. And this depiction of As, Asar, and Heru and our mythology around that. We also have the Kepra, which is the principle of transformation or alchemy, turning something out of nothing. And regenerative growth, or excuse me, restorative growth is what I've said we're presenting. So rest restoration is the act of returning to something that was, right? So this acknowledges the fact that we're in a cyclical universe and that we weren't always in this position. So we're coming back around in the spiral. And it's sense of standing that, yeah, we're in that cosmic order. We're already, we've already won because we know what goes up must come down and come back around. And we're already won. We're already united. We're already one. So all the things that we need, we already have. We also have this principle of smaitawi, where you have the gravity and levity coming together to create, because the gravity is seen as a, I wasn't able to go into the mythology, but as a defining force that is a opposing force to levity. But at a point, there's that harmony and that merging of the two, because they have to destroy something that's considered to be uh, unnecessary chaos and disorder. And I, I'm, I really am not gonna be able to elaborate so much on the things about the solar cycles, but I'm gonna show you some charts from the national, um, the NASA and NOAA um, and their data on sunspots because we keep hearing about climate change in the context of which is really a continuation of that global um, warming narrative that like the planet is warming and all of these things. But really what we're dealing with is actually a grand solar minimum as they would call it in the, um, in the, in NASA, for, this is actually from NASA. And this is showing that the sun solar activity or the radioactive activity, the electromagnetism of the sun is actually going into a lower space. And you can see here in a more extended framework because you're looking at from 1900 that there are periods where every 11 years the sun goes into its lower space. So it's just the cycle of it. And what we're experiencing right now is that lower space. And usually it correlates with some type of revolutionary regime change and all kinds of different things, which are, you can definitely look into. So in the context of planetary healing, we're really dealing with a parasitic energy, which is what is that unnecessary chaos and disorder that has to be removed. It's a, parasite, it's a parasite on the planet and it's a parasite on our spirit. It's literally um, feeding off of us and to our own demise and destruction. And the planet is in a state of purging and healing and that's why it's experiencing a heating. You can think of it the way you would think of a fever. Um, the body has and the, the planet has its internal mechanisms to heal itself. Our ancestors called this unnecessary parasitic energy APEP, and they showed the bolt of Ra as the way to move through that disorder. It was also perceived to be the transitional space from death into the new life, that rebirth space. So when you go into your transition before you're reborn or the ancestors reborn, we're all reborn ancestors, we go through that period of, um, of darkness that we call the duat. And I'm quickly just gonna talk about uh, the 11 pillar platform of Tehuti Ma'at and how this approach is connected to agriculture. One, we begin with spiritual warriorship as the foundation because it's really about the leadership, making sure that we're embodying the things that we're saying and making sure we're coming from an authentic place. That's foundational. And from there, making sure that the integrity is key and we know why we're doing. So the plan, you have to plan your farm in its holistic context with integrity. What are you going to be true to? And are you holding space for the totality of everything that was just shared? The second pillar is nature. And this is natural sequences. This is when you come in humbly and you observe nature and you listen to the land and what the land has to say to you. And you see what's working for the land, what the land wants to create. And you listen and honor that in your sculpting and planning for your farm work. 
or your agricultural vision and project. The healing aspect is really the energy work that's necessary when we're going into agricultural work. There's an energy layer of that ethereal energy space that's very important to acknowledge. And it also transitions into the ancestors, which is pillar four. Having that altar and shrine space is very significant for a restorative agricultural um, program. And from there, pillar five is Africa, is having that connectivity to home base and making sure that you're looking to the continent for direction in terms of, in, in, in holistic terms. And pillar six is sovereignty. So this is about being off grid, right? Having those solar power, having that solar power, figuring out all the ways that you can supply your own water supply and all of the basic needs that we talked about can be met for yourself in this agricultural project and that being woven into your plan and unity, community. Community is key, making sure that you are uniting with the people who are necessary, which they're probably already aligned. It's just about that weaving. Um, and making sure that community is the key foundation of how you move forward with the work in a uniform and united context. And on the production end for pillar eight, it's thinking about manufacturing and producing from what you're growing on the farm and not focusing on raw materials. And in the context of power, it's really about organization, um, making sure that you create systems where you're going to be able to wield power with your agricultural program. And for Pillar 10 Freedom, it's really about feeding the people. You know, that creates freedom on the baseline because we're talking about survival and revolution, creating a new system. So I give thanks. I know I went over, so I'm gonna come yeah. back. Thank you, thank you. And um, before we get started with Q&A, because I know you guys probably have a lot of questions to ask, we're going, I'm, I want to first introduce our speaker that we had today. And we just want to give, I'm sorry, give gratitude to her for definitely bringing something very new to the table for us to hear. And we thank you for that. And so I want to um, start by, you know, trust and verify that all our presenters are doing well, solid work, as you can see and hear from this presentation. Their affiliation with our summit is due to our alignment with their goals and mission. The presentations provided at our summit does not constitute an endorsement of speakers' views, products, or service. And I want to read the sister's bio so you guys can get a more in-depth understanding on what she does, the work that she do, and all the things that she's doing so far and in the future. So she is a farmer healing, healing, farmer healing artist and activist. Asna Feka is an educator, cosmic wisdom leader, and spiritual warrior. Her modalities include, include restorative agriculture and herbalism. She is deeply inspired by the indigenous spirituality of humanity's ancestors and infuses her work with their awareness, knowledge, and wisdom. She is the co-founder of Te Tehuti Mahat. Tehuti Mahat is an international grassroots community organization focused on realizing the African world revolution through healing, creative, creative and educational programs and transitional business models. She is currently managed, manages an organic farm in West Africa and also directs the Tehuti Ma'at's Organic Food for the People program, which is an ur urban farm program centered in the historic West Val district of Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much. And um, I'll have let Costco take it away for um, starting Q&A. All right, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, let's give everyone a round of, of applause. I'll do it myself. And um, I wanna open the floor up for questions right now. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself uh, if you have one. Uh, is this uh, Miss, Miss Brigham? Go ahead. I don't have a question at this time. I was just sending my applause virtually. Oh, that was a clap, not a not a raised hand. Excuse, excuse my uh, 
my my uh, my lack of Zoom knowledge there on that one. Um, well, I have a question. If uh if uh no one else has a question, um, how how did you uh go about establishing um your your farm over um in in, in West Africa and and how are you being received there? Give thanks for that question. Um, so I'm actually here. We're a very small island. Um, it's a volcanic island. It has less than 3,000 people on this entire island. Um, and I came here, I was, although I was born in the divided states, my parents, both my mother and father, and my four mothers and four forefathers are from this island, this small island. And my father actually moved here about 15 years ago, moved back here. He never really liked it there. He moved back here. I hadn't really come. But um, I had, as a child, we had come and gone to other islands because it's actually 10 islands that make up Cabo Verde. And I never actually came to this island where they were born and where they're from. I went to the capital and some of the other places that have a lot of tourism. And long story short, I finally came back here with my partner and he and I had a transformational experience and it was literally the initiation of the land. The land was like, it's time. <laughs> and we did not go back the same. And I didn't know, I, I always knew I wanted to come back here, but like the, the whole process happened and I actually got, um, came here for one month last February uh, <laughs> and um, COVID, happened everything got shut down so then I ended up staying here um but yeah I'm basically taking care of my inheritance which is the land that my father's been curating and I'm getting a lot of positive um feedback from here my father's actually the most um critical voice that I have which is like all the things you're trying to do aren't going to work it doesn't make any sense and he just has that perspective but I see that to be the gravity and the thing that I need to strengthen myself for the work that I'm here to do so all the other people are very supportive, but we have a lot of challenges with the mind set, the literal colonization of the people. And I'm sure that that is reflected all over the planet right now. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so it's much nice. for that. I actually do have a question now. This is Chaisa. I do appreciate you for your presentation and your knowledge of things that aren't spoken of often. I learned a lot um, from what you shared today. Um, I am new to farming. I was an educator by trade, served in the local district. And I and my husband, who's a veteran, are moving into farming. We want to, we've got a plot of land and we've been experimenting for a year um, you know, just growing all kinds of things. And some things we were able to succeed in, some things we weren't. But um, I've developed a group, I've gathered some folks who are like-minded in that way. And I really want to take the energy that we have that's present now and create a cooperative that would really impact our community health-wise, because there's a lot of, um, you know, disparities. And then even the health and life expect, ex, expectancy is significantly different in our community compared to others around us. So I really want to take what we're learning about agriculture and impact our community. So my question is, what does it look like to be successful when you have a group of people who are on the same page and really want to um, make a change? What does it look like to get started to work together? Okay, good, thanks. I wanna first thank you for answering the call. And um, I also just all praises due to the ancestors and the divine that's indwelling within us all for all of this work and everything that's happening. So what that looks like, I would suggest initially is figuring out what that looks like for the unique individuals that are uniting and coming together for that particular vision and project. The vision work is very important. Don't underestimate it. I see it as a holistic, that holistic symmetry that I talked about, right? We wanna take a step with the left foot and the right foot. So that way we're having forward motion. So while you're doing that envisioning and that um, 
really figuring out all the details of how your cooperative is going to come together. I had to rush through the presentation. I had a lot to say about cooperatives because our institution is a cooperative and all the institutions that we build and develop are cooperatives. So I'm glad that you already have that key. So you guys want to get clear on what it is that you want to create, why you're creating it. I would start with who, what, where, when, why. And then you can focus on the how. So your organics, your heirloom seeds, making sure your seeds are, are not um, genetically modified or engineered. And you're going to the most original source of seeds you can. Um, thinking about like the composting, not using the chemicals, all that, that's the how stuff. So making sure you're all on the same page with that is important while you're taking those first steps of also creating your infrastructure. So you can still do infrastructure while you're there. But you want to make sure, like I talked about the natural sequencing, you're looking at the nature of that land, you're thinking about the ancestors who were on that land, right, and all of that, and you're listening to their direction, because it's bigger than the vision that you have, right, we're thinking 11 generations, 200,000 generations, right, we're thinking about the continuation of humanity and a thriving future. So that's what I would suggest is to tap into the creative energy of all the unique individuals that are coming together because there's gonna be so much power there already. Thank you. Good, thanks. I, I saw a question come in about the youth. Do you wanna, um, can you read that to me? Okay. Yeah, yes, it just Miss 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 Stewart, one of our elders, she um she asked, Do you involve the youth in the community to assist you? Yes. So here currently, um, I have a lot of um my family members, the children um that live in this village who come and support me. I always have them starting seeds and really I'm working on shifting their perspective out of the narrative of like looking looking frowning upon agriculture and just wanting to do like office work and just like there's that happening so because i came from um the states they have already that colonized mindset of like grandeur and thinking of like oh she came from there so they value the things that i say a lot more um than you know the their family that's been farming for generations so I involved them a lot and I wanted to show this because I didn't get to show the end of the presentation and everything is about the youth. Everything is about the children. So Tehuti Ma'at, because they're the future. We wouldn't like, we have to invest in the youth. That's what it's all about. It's about efficiency and intelligence, right? That's that Tehuti. And the Ma'at is like that intergenerational aspect, the elders, the leadership and guidance of the elders, as well as the, um, the action and, implementation of the youth work. So this is like our Sankofa program, which was the initiation of our organization. We have the Organic Food for the People project, which you can see here, like the raw workshops. We do a lot of work with youth, different programs, after school programs, um, emotionally challenged, or they call them emotionally disturbed children. I really don't like that label, but children that are going through, um, you know, trauma and are institutionalized. Um, within the, the Eurocentric system. So we do a lot of work with the youth and it's mainly educational work and we learning, we're learning and teaching because our children are already coming in with so much knowledge and information. So I just wanted to share that because we have so many different cooperative institutions and our goal, we're a cooperative um, developer. Um, so helping other, other institutions and other groups establish themselves. So that's why I also wanted to make sure that the contact information is available for all of you, especially the sister that just mentioned her program. We would love to be a support and we're a resource mechanism. So that's what we're here for. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you guys have any more questions, please join us tonight at 6 p.m. And you can and ask away and talk to all, all our pre presenters that we have. And before we close out, I want to first um, just share my screen real quick and give, give, just give thanks to our um, black owned and operated sponsors that we have that's, that, is, that is supporting our movement and supporting our mission to give, to bring this information out for you guys to enjoy and to learn. So our, well, first we have Sustainable Community Solutions Network, LLC, and 
We also, we also have um, the original Carla Green's Cultural Festival as our booths. And we wanna give thanks to AYA International Development and Indigenous Knowledge Institute. And also we wanna give thanks to Black Hand Craft as well. And we wanna give thanks to our Eco Womanist Institute for supporting us as well. Give thanks and give thanks to our BSS community of volunteers who is running the show behind the scenes. So thank you all for so much. And um, we also wanna thank you for joining us and thank you for tuning in and listening. And we hope to see you guys um, attend other presentations that's happening, that's happening so far. And also don't forget to um, join our platform and here's our contact information as well. And yeah, this is just a little bit about us, but I won't hold you guys any longer. So here, here's the next, um, presentation that's happening at two o'clock. So right now, Don't Brace for Impact with Kamala Sanders. And at 2.30, we have What a Waste with Crystal Beasley. All right, hope to see you guys out there. Thank you so much. Give thanks. Give thanks. Thank you, everyone.